who rises and wait upon the moon, wait upon the moon, wait upon the moon. So who rises we wait upon the moon, wait upon the moon, we wait upon the moon. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God, you do not faint, you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak, you comfort those who need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Comfort those who need You lift us up On wings like eagles You are the everlasting God The everlasting God You do not faint You won't grow weary You're the defender of the weak You comfort those who need You lift us up Welcome to our service this morning. We want to welcome our special guests. Thanks for coming. God bless you guys. Wow. I love it. I used to have a motorcycle. It was a Sears Roebuck. <laughs> really a hot one, man. Really a good one. Luckily, I quit riding before I killed myself on that thing, but uh, I had one. And uh, we are waiting upon the Lord this morning to do great things. Father, we pray that you will bless us this morning and pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. And it's exciting to have our friends here with us, friends in Christ. And uh, all over the world, there are people celebrating you this morning and have already celebrated you. And Lord, it's just a beautiful thing to know that no matter what happens in this world, in this nation even, and it's all been good in this nation, but Lord, no matter what happens in this nation, we are yours. This is not our home. We are living in tents here. Lord, one day we will be home for good. And it'll be wonderful, and there'll be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more crime, <laughs> no more tearing down of anything. It'll all be good. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Andy? Okay, <laughs> please stand.
Please be seated.
Stand for the last song.
Amidst all the crazy that's going on around us, God, I pray that you will help us be a light. Lord, shine through us so that we can love each other, unify the church, Lord. The devil is attacking us and trying to separate the church, Lord. But I pray that you'll keep us united with your Holy Spirit so that we can be a light in this very dark world. In your holy name, amen. Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel. Blessed to see you guys here this morning and wonderful time of worship. And um, couldn't help but think of what happened in Acts chapter 2 is Jesus. We have victory in Jesus. And Peter says this in Acts chapter 2. At verse 23, he says, This man, speaking of Jesus... Delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Two of my favorite words in the Bible, in verse 24, but God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death. And that, my brothers and sisters, is why we are here this morning to celebrate that victory in Jesus, that death could not hold him uh, and hell could not keep him. Uh, He has risen, and He has risen indeed. Uh, I already heard our friends being welcomed over here. Our club um, reminds me of the first time I ever gave my testimony. Uh, It was actually at a church called New Wine in Anaheim, which was a biker's club. Pastor Bob was the pastor back then, probably 15 years, 14, 13 years ago. He's still there. Praise the Lord. First time I ever gave my testimony, and uh, um, so welcome. And good to uh, see you guys here this morning. So with that, why don't we go ahead and open our Bibles this morning. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 as we continue our verse-by-verse study through the book of Corinthians. And as you're turning there, I'll go ahead and open us with prayer once again. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for... Your grace, Lord, that you have lavished, your word says, upon us. This grace, this unmerited favor, this merciful kindness, I like that. The merciful kindness that you have shown mankind. And Lord, thank you for these who have willingly accepted this free gift, this grace, have received this grace through Jesus Christ, and who are now children of God who are now living in this grace and who are personifying this grace to the world, that there is victory in Jesus, that he can break the chains and the bondages of sin. And so, Father, as we study your word here this morning, I pray that your spirit would be moving as your spirit already is in the hearts of men and women here this morning as we desire to be more like you, God. I pray that it's each of our prayer that we would be transformed daily into your image and your likeness. That's what you said, that you're transforming all of us into the image of Jesus. And so, Father, help us to surrender in those areas where we need to surrender. As truly as we're going to look here this morning, God, you you want all of us. You don't want part of us. You don't want one day a week. 
You want all of us. You want our very lives. And so, Lord, use your word here this morning to do your work, to accomplish the purposes that you have set it forth to do. We love you and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It's important to remember the context of chapter 8 and 9. As Paul is going to be speaking on a topic of generosity, a topic of giving, you may say. And so the context here, remember what had happened. We read about it in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That the church in Jerusalem, the mother church, where this work of Christianity began. Remember Jesus, before he went to the cross, he told his disciples. And after he was resurrected, he even told his disciples to go to Jerusalem. And to wait there in Jerusalem until the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit would fall upon them. And so this work of God began in Jerusalem. And remember that beautiful picture of what happened there on the day of Pentecost. That Peter went forth and began proclaiming the word of God. Began proclaiming the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the Son of God. He is the one he claimed to be. Look at the proof. He was resurrected from the dead. He is the Son of God. And so when Peter began to preach this message, what happened? The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2 that men's heart, men and women were pierced to the heart with these words. Truly only God's word can penetrate our hearts. And so they began to cry out, well, what should we do now? We've sinned before God. We've crucified the very Son of God. What should we do now? And Peter says, repent and be saved. And so many people, we're told 3,000 people on the first day came to know Jesus. So you had 3,000 people who were predominantly Jewish. Remember the day of Passover and, and Pentecost, these feast days, people traveled from all over the world, Jews, to come and celebrate these days. And so as they heard this message that Peter was proclaiming, the Spirit was moving and people were being saved. And you know what the people determined in their minds? They said, you know what, I don't want to go home. <laughs> uh, whatever just happened here, I want more of it. Jesus touched them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they were new. Their, their old lives, they could care less about them anymore. They said, we don't want to go back home. We, we want to keep chasing whatever it is that just touched us. Remember, they were living in this State of koinonia, the Bible says. This fellowship of the brethren. Another translation could be a sharing of common things. You see, these people didn't want to go back home, so they stayed there in Jerusalem. But what happened was, is you had all these people now who needed to eat, who needed to do these things. And so we read of this church beginning to sell everything they had. Or to put it in a common pot to try to take care of these other people who chose to leave their lives behind. A very noble act. A very noble act. Unfortunately, the need far exceeded what they had. And then you read there was this great famine that took place. So the church in Jerusalem began to struggle financially. And so in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul tells us, that he had already sent word to these churches, these Gentile churches, I might add. These offshoots of this church in Jerusalem that where the work started. From that work in Jerusalem, many churches were planted. These churches in northern Greece that Paul's going to speak about here in verse 1. These churches in Macedonia in the northern region of Greece, whereas Corinth would be sitting at the southern region of Greece. He brought to these churches' attention that this church was struggling. Now we're going to read here that Paul wasn't begging them for money. In fact, Paul just let them know the church was struggling. And what we're going to read is the people were begging Paul to be able to help this church. You see, that's really, guys, in the house of God, and the family of God, that's the way it's supposed to be. When we hear of a need and we have the ability to meet the need, God will see here too. It's God who wills in us generosity because he has first given so much to us 
And so these churches were begging to be able to help this other church. And so Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16 to take up a collection. And so it's interesting here because what we're going to see here is that this church kind of made a promise, the Corinthian church. That they would do like the other churches, but they kind of were really slow about it. It's been over a year now that Paul's writing this other letter, and he's going to gently kind of remind them about what they had promised and the importance of what they're trying to accomplish here. You see, what we're going to see is it's all about equality, guys. Giving messages, can, and this isn't a giving message. We go verse by verse, those of you who are here every week. I don't customize messages uh, when the giving's down to boost uh, the giving. You see, when tithing is talked about or giving to God, it's about equality. It's not expecting those who have a lot of money to give so that the people with no money can have a lot of money. And it's not the other way around. It's about equality. You think about how God created the heavens and the earth. Are we all in agreement of that? That it's God who provides the very food that you and I eat. It comes from God and not McDonald's. <laughs> My kids were shocked to hear that, you know, hamburgers came from cows, not from McDonald's. <laughs> but God provides our sustenance. And so the idea is equality, meaning that no one should be hungry, guys. No one in the world should be hungry, hungry, but sadly, what do we see? We see poverty. We see hunger. And on the contrary, nobody should be hoarding. Nobody should be hoarding. This is what the message is about. It's equality. It's all of us doing our part. No one hoarding and no one being hungry. And so keep that in mind as you look at the world today. I see a lot of hoarding, and I see a lot of hunger. I see a lot of abuses. I see a lot of things. But let's look at it in the light of what God has to say about the issue. And so this is the context. Is Paul is reminding them about their promise to give to this hurting church in Jerusalem. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1. says, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. Verse 3 says, For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave out of their own accord, begging us to much urging for the favor of the participation and the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God, verse 6 says, So we urge Titus that as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete it. So you, in you, this gracious work as well. So Paul reminds him about these churches up north in Macedonia. Remember, one of the churches up in Macedonia happened to be Philippi. This little church of Philippi that began, you can read about this in Acts also, they began by Paul entering in and meeting this woman named Lydia, who was a maker of purple. Uh, she dealt with purple fabrics. She was the first convert. Then they ministered to this woman who was given to fortune-telling, demon-possessed. Remember, she was set free from these demonic presences, and she was baptized, and she wanted to follow Paul. Then Paul, remember, and Titus, or Paul and uh, Silas were thrown into prison. I said Barnabas last, last week, correction. They were thrown into prison, and we remember the whole story. Through that whole event, the jailer was saved. The jailer's family was saved, and maybe even some of those prisoners were saved. This began the church in Philippi. And why it's important is because what did Paul say? He says this church, these churches in Macedonia who are under heavy affliction and in deep poverty. Paul says these churches up north don't have any money. They're poor. He says, but they were giving out of their poverty 
this great abundance. They, they gave liberally. They gave generously. You see, what I find interesting, guys, is that's usually the way that it works. It's usually a poor person who understands poverty who then gives to other poor people. Sadly, oftentimes, and it's not a rebuke against people with money, but it's, it's, a, it's a truth. People with money don't know what it's like to be poor. So it's often poor people who go out of their way to give to other poor people because they know what it's like to be down to the last dollar. They know what it's like to be in the food bank line, humbling themselves in a line to get food to eat. And so this is what we see with these churches who had very little, yet they were the ones who Paul was going to encourage. It was their desire, but he was going to encourage them to give to this church in Jerusalem. You see, here's what I love about God, too. In this giving, guys, it's not about money. You see, Paul, there is a principle at work here, because God is always at work, guys. Even when you think you throw that dollar in the plate or five dollars here, or you help a brother out or a sister out with this, there's always a work that God is doing underneath the surface. Let me paint this picture to you. Paul is asking these Gentile churches who are poor to give to this church in Jerusalem. Remember who made up the church at Jerusalem? It was predominantly Jewish. And remember that Jews, for a long time, felt this division against the Gentile Christians. Remember, the Jews felt that these Gentile Christians should first become Jewish and then Christian. So they kind of had this uh, insecurity, uh, inferiority, uh, whatever you want to call it. They didn't believe that these Gentile Christians were even really part of the faith. And so you see what God is doing here? He's using a church that these Jewish believers didn't think should even be Christians to support them. Isn't that amazing what God does, guys? Paul is using these Gentile churches. God is using them to administer this expression of love. Isn't that what love is? Love is giving, guys. And so Paul, God, through Paul, is showing this Jewish church... In Jerusalem, the love of God through the Gentile church. Because really, when you think about it, that's what giving is, guys. Giving is an expression of love. You may say to me, oh yeah, can you prove that in the word of God? Sure. How about John 3.16? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Oh, the ultimate expression of love is giving. First, we will see of giving of ourselves. But you see, here's another truth about this impoverished church giving out of their poverty. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. He gave his disciples this uh, little story of these two debtors. One of these men owed a substantial amount of money. The other man owned just a little bit of money. And so when it came time to pay, the king forgave both of them their debts. The one who was, had a ton of debt and the other one who had no debt. The king forgave both of them their debts. And so Jesus turned to the disciples and he said, Who do you think will love the king more, the one who's been forgiven a lot or the one who's been forgiven a little? And I think it was Peter who said, well, probably the one who had been forgiven a lot. You see, there's a principle behind that, guys. The one who has had a lot of debt, a lot of weighed down by sin, may I even say who has been an instrument of the devil, willingly or unwillingly, before we came to Christ, guys, we were all serving the devil in some capacity. We were all slaves to sin. We were all slaves to self. And so it's those who have been forgiven much who then love much. And love, what is the true expression of love? It's giving. It's the one who says, I have been forgiven much and now I will love much. It's often those who are like the Jews who were there in Jerusalem who once they had this touch of Jesus and they were filled with the Spirit, they said, I don't want that old life anymore. 
This is what it is. I've been forgiven much and it, it tasted good and I can see that God is good and I want more of it. And so you can say those who have been forgiven much, love much, and they will give much first of themselves. They will give themselves to God. So verse 2 said that God had also blessed these churches in Greece. In Achaia, this is where Corinthians, the Corinthian church was sitting. But God was blessing these impoverished churches. It's often those who know poverty, guys, who can then give to others who are in need. He said that their poverty overflowed in liberty. Remember, Jesus knows what we're doing and what we're giving. Remember the example given there as Jesus was at the temple. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Jesus was there at the temple with his disciples, and I find it fascinating that Jesus was sitting across from the offering box. And Jesus was watching the offering box. And remember, Jesus said he saw some wealthy people come, and they, they dumped a whole bunch of money in the offering box. And then remember, there was this little old lady who came, and she had two mites, less than a penny each. And she put both of these mites in the box. Remember, Jesus said something fascinating about this woman. He says that she has given more than all of the other people combined. Now, I'm not too good with math, but I'm good enough with math to know that that doesn't add up. How did she give more than all these other guys? Well, you see, it's safe to say, guys, that Jesus isn't so much concerned with the amount that is given. You see, it's the cost at which you give that Jesus is concerned about. It's what it costs you to give. Think about it. Somebody with a million dollars who writes a check for $100,000, that's a lot of money. But when you think about it, to the person who has a million dollars, he still has $900,000 to live on. What about the person who has $10,000 and gives $1,000? Well, I would say he only has $9,000 now to live on. You see, that's how God sees the matter. It's not the amount we give. It's what it costs us to give. And think about that widow too, guys. She gave out of her ability, but she gave beyond her ability. You see, she would have been completely justified to take those two mites and put one in her pocket and put one in the treasury. Completely justified. But yet she put both of them there in the box. And again, it's a picture of her not just giving out of her ability, but uh, above her ability. You could say that the widow gave of herself and not of her money. That's what it was. She gave everything she had. She gave of herself, not of her money. Verse 3 said that the Paul reminds us, he says, I testify that according to their ability, he's speaking of these churches in the north, that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of the participation in the support of the saints. You see, they were giving beyond their ability. It's a blessing, guys. You see, they're begging Paul for this opportunity to give, to help out, to participate, because they understand what giving is. And so they're begging him, and we need to remember that when we're giving. First, it will be God who gives us the desire to give. If you're giving for any other reason than that, then you're giving for the wrong reasons. If you're giving to be seen by men or to somehow or earn more credits with God, you're giving for the wrong reason. You should be giving because God has given you the desire to give, and it's a blessing. It's not a burden. If you feel that it's a burden, then God would say, then don't do it. Then don't do it. It's not meant to be a burden. Remember, we're talking about this equality. You see, we're going to get to it next week. I'm sorry, yes, another message on giving. But you see how it's not just about money. 
2 Corinthians 9, Paul says this about giving, that God loves, at verse 7, he said, God loves a cheerful giver. The word can be translated hilarious. A hilarious giver. He's not doing it under compulsion. He's not doing it under begrudging. Or he's not doing it begrudgingly. Oh, here comes the bag. I gotta put two dollars in there. Don't do it. God doesn't need our money, guys. See, he's giving us the ability to participate with him. That's all it is. I mean, we're going to look at some of the things here probably next week. I'll mention a few of the things that God has done through our little church. It's hard for me to speak about money with our church because we have a very generous church. We are small, but we are mighty. Dale will tell you. It's not one person who floats the whole church at this church. It's a bunch of us little people contributing faithfully to the work of God that allows us to do so the supporting of a church in Mexico, Ensenada, Pastor Charlie, Greg out there in Ensenada as well, Genesis Diaz, the orphanage. What about the new church that we just took on with, with uh, Sister Elena out in Kamaloo? $10,000 and then some going to build a house, going to restore a recovery home, going to put a well in. So they can have crops, so they can grow their own food. Because we can't keep sending a whole bunch of money to feed them. So we're coming alongside and trying to help them be able to sustain themselves. What about Family Life Pregnancy Center who counsels these young moms? What about the upkeep of the church? Trying to be good stewards of what God has blessed us with. Resurfacing the parking lot, changing all the lights. Cutting the grass, watering the grass, doing all these sorts of things. You see, guys, it's when we all understand how much God has given us. And we, uh, when I give, I give because it makes me excited to give. Because there was a time where I didn't have anything to give. There was a time when I didn't have anything to give. And when God gives you the ability then... And he puts the desire in your heart. It should be with a joyful heart. And seeing the fruit of what is becoming of what you're putting into. But Paul never begged them for money. They were begging him. I'm not going to mention a name, but there was a person in our church who came to me one day and said that they had come into some money and that they wanted to hand me a check. And I'm not used to seeing checks like that. And I actually asked the person, I said, well, is there something you want to see done with this? See, because here's another thing. A lot of times somebody who's wanting to give a big amount of money wants some work to be done. They want strings attached to that money. Is that right or is that wrong? I don't know. It's the person wanting to give the gift. So I asked him, is there something you want to see with this money? And he says, nope. He says, whatever the church wants to do, God just told me to give it to you. So you know what we did with this guy's money? A good portion of it was used for the Mexico operation. You see, what we bring in goes out. We, we do save. Thank God we saved during times like this. The economy's tanking and all these sorts of things. But see, if you start cutting off the conduit of God blessing you and, and you want to shore it up and you want to stockpile it all for yourselves, well, then God will cut that conduit off. He wants us to receive and to then give out. This is what Paul is encouraging this church to do. They've received all these blessings of God now. Use them to help others, to share, to participate in the work of God. He says that they weren't expected. Verse 5, Paul says, I didn't expect them to do this. They did it out of their own will. And that's where it needs to start, guys. Let God put it in your heart to do something for him, not anyone else. Let God do that work. Paul wasn't expecting them to do anything. He was putting the needs out there very similar, similar to what we do here. I keep you guys in the loop with things that come my way. 
Some I don't. The board will attest. Some things we don't let out. And God just provides anyways. But sometimes I feel like we want to allow people. Because here's what that person told me that gave us the check. He doesn't even want to be recognized or mentioned because he doesn't want his blessing to be taken from him. He doesn't want his name on the seat. He doesn't want to become the assistant pastor. He doesn't want something for it. That's a genuine heart. That is giving for the right reason. Because here's the reality. Once it leaves our hands, guys, we have given it to God, and it's in somebody else's hands now. Now somebody else is going to be responsible for that. Paul's going to get into that too. There needs to be accountability. There needs to be trust in this matter also. But here's what I love too about God loving a cheerful giver, a hilarious giver. Remember the story in Exodus chapter 36, verses 5 through 7. Let me paint the picture here. The people, Israel, had just come out of bondage and slavery from Egypt. They were now in this wilderness, this desert. I'm sure some of them were very excited at first. Remember, they'd spent 40 years in that wilderness. But one thing God wanted to do with them while they were in the wilderness is to build a tabernacle. To build a place where the people could come and worship God. A place where they could say God would dwell, although God did not just dwell in the tabernacle, but it was a place where they could come to meet with God. And so God gave them the opportunity. Remember, He gave Moses and Aaron all the specifics of what was going to be needed and all of the dimensions of this tabernacle and how to build it. And then God says, just simply go to the people and say, hey guys, here's what God said, here's the plan, and watch what happens. Lo and behold, you read in Exodus 36, verse 5 through 7, that some guys came to Moses and said, Hey, you you need to tell the people to stop bringing in all this stuff. Stop bringing in all these materials. We don't know what we're going to do with them. You see, that's hilarious giving. That's understanding being a participant with God. When somebody has to tell you, Hey, hey, stop putting money in the treasury. Does that happen today? Today? Depends, I guess. Does it matter? Not to us. The work will continue. But you see, they were giving more. They were giving of themselves. I love what James chapter 4, 7 through 17, guys, because you see, they understood also in verse 5 when Paul said he didn't expect it, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. That's where it starts, doesn't it? You first give yourselves to the Lord. That's what James says, James 4, 7 through 17, when James says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Submit yourself to God. Give yourselves to God as a living sacrifice, the Bible says. You see, that's where the giving is first understood, the grace of God in what God has given to us. Give first yourself to God, and then God will give you the will to give to others. Isn't that what Jesus said? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's it. That's the first and the second commandment. The first commandment and the second part of it. That's all God is all all about, guys. It's equality. It's loving God. Receiving the blessings of God and then loving our neighbors. Verse 7, Paul says, But just as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and all the earnestness and in all and in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. You see, it had been a year. Apparently this church, when Paul was talking about the collection once a week, this church was kind of putting it off. It's been a year now. 
So all Paul's saying is, hey, here, here's what's going on in Macedonia, guys. These little poor churches who aren't wealthy, this Corinthian church, you may say, was a little more wealthy. And so Paul's saying these poor churches up here are giving what they have. It's not the amount, it's, it's the principle behind it. So you guys said you wanted to get involved. Well, hey, are you guys going to get involved or not? That's all he's saying. He says, just as you abound in faith and utterance. Remember this church in the first letter. They were exercising the gifts of God. They were speaking in tongues. Things were a little bit out of order. And Paul began to lay out the gifts of the Spirit and these sorts of things. And so this church had received the gifts of God. They were using the gifts of God, but yet here was an instance where they weren't giving to God. You know people like that? Who want everything from God, but then they never give anything back to God. So that's all he's saying. Hey, you, you, you're wanting all these gifts and these, this faith and these sorts of things. Well, then with the same earnestness, can't you see the love that can be shown by you now supporting your sister church? That's all Paul's saying. 1 Corinthians 12 is where Paul talked about all those gifts. And what was the greatest gift, guys? Love. Love is the greatest gift. Here, you're wanting all the, the powerful gifts, all of the, the gifts that are seen. But yet the greatest gift is love. And this is the one that you are neglecting. Or may I say, here's your opportunity to prove your love. Remember when James talks about those who say, I love you, to somebody who is in need, and they say, oh, go be well, brother. I love you. Go be well. I'll be praying for you. When you have the means to help that brother or sister, that's what love is. Love isn't saying, I love you. Love is saying, hey, I love you to the point where if I have it, I can help you. You're hungry? You know what? We got a little extra food. I love what Acts 20, verse 35 says. It's quoted that Jesus said this, although we can't see it. We can see similar things that Jesus said. But Paul says, you must remember to help the weak. Just as the Lord said... It is better to give than it is to receive. It's better to give than it is to receive. Verse 8, Paul says, this isn't a commandment, guys. He says, I'm not speaking this as a commandment, but as a proving through the earnestness of others, the sincerity of your love also. Remember, giving is an expression of what? Love. That's all he's saying is, here's your opportunity to prove your love to this church. Your brothers and sisters, that's all it is. In fact, he's going to say in verse 9, For you know that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Don't you remember what Jesus said? He said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus became poor so that you and I may become rich. Philippians 2 talks about that, verses 5 through 7, that Jesus actually emptied himself, guys. Emptied him of his deity, not of his deity, but of his powers as deity. When Jesus was hungry, he could have just made food appear and eaten it, but he did not. He became, like Paul would say, all things to all men, that he might win some to Christ. Jesus set aside his privileges as God for you and I. The humanity of Jesus, the human side, being 100% God and 100% man at the same time. Even in the garden, when they came to arrest Jesus, you don't think Jesus for one moment could have just went, Boop, and they all would have been gone? Absolutely, he's God. But yet he endured these things. He endured the cross. He endured the death. Why? He died the death of a slave, of a murderer. As an innocent man, why did he do these things? So that you and I could be sitting here 2,000 some years ago and have a relationship with him. That one day we will see him 
face to face. One day we will know him as he knows us. One day he has prepared a place for us. This inheritance that the book of Romans talks about. In fact, I want to look at this Romans chapter 8 at verse 15, guys. That Jesus becoming poor so that we may become rich. Romans 8, 15. Paul says this. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Oh, what a powerful verse to share with young men and women who maybe don't have a father in their life, an earthly father. But yet God describes himself to you and I as a father that you can have a good father, that you have a good father in God, and we can be adopted. Does anyone want to be adopted into this family? It's pretty easy to be adopted into this family. You see, we just receive Jesus Christ. We cry out and say, yes, Lord, I, I confess I have sinned. Nobody else really knows about this sin and that sin, but I understand now today that you know about this sin. It's against you I have sinned, so forgive me of these sins, God. Cleanse me, wash me. I want a new life. I don't want to go back to the place that I came from. That man that has been crucified with Christ needs to stay in the grave. And when that hand keeps wanting to poke out of the dirt, we got to stomp that hand back down. That man needs to stay dead. Why? Because we're new creatures in Christ. Verse 16 says, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Isn't that an amazing thing? That His Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are His. This joy, this peace, this confidence, this comfort the God of all comfort, that we are his children. Also, guys, it doesn't stop there. Not only are you a child of God, but guess what? You're a spoiled child of God. He says you are an heir. This kingdom that I have that will come to pass on this earth for a thousand years and then a kingdom in heaven to come, you are an heir of this. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him so that we may also be glorified with Him. You see, we become like Christ did on this earth, right? Sometimes we even look, people look at us and they, they mock us. They make fun of us. They don't see why. Why is it so important to gather together as a body of believers? That's all you do is read your Bible. Well, hopefully we read it and then do what it says, but they're right. Yes, I just want to read my Bible. It's an amazing thing to think that 15 years, 20 years later, that my Friday nights would consist of opening up the Word of God and being excited about doing that. There was a time in my life where that was like, you're kidding me, right? I could be out doing a lot of different things, but now I have a desire to just read my Bible, to have fellowship with God, to know God, to understand God, to have a relationship with God, to walk before God, to see God move, to be a part of Him moving. So this is what we have, guys. Christ became poor so that we may become rich. He says in verse 10, back in 2 Corinthians 8, I love this. He says, it's to your advantage. Verse 10 says, I give my opinion in this matter. Remember, it's not commanded that you guys need to do this. It was first your desire. Now you're kind of pulling back on that desire. Paul's going to say, do it. D don't pull back on it. When God gives you this desire, do it. <laughs> Remember Moses again in the Exodus as God had led them out of Egypt and they were running uh, quickly, moving away from Pharaoh and Egypt. And uh, they came to the dead end. The Red Sea. It was right in front of them and there was mountains on the left and mountains on the right. And they were all excited. God set us free. Yeah. And they're booking it out and everything's good until they hit the Red Sea. And they were like, uh-oh. 
Turn around, and here comes Pharaoh with all of his army. But something fascinating here, guys, because sometimes it's a time to pray and sometimes it's a time to move. Stop praying and move. Because what happened? They were there at the Red Sea and the people were crying out, God, help. And apparently even Moses began to pray because then what did God say? It's in Exodus 14. I'm going to read it here. Exodus 14 at verse 10. It always sounds better when God says it and not me. It says, As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, See, Moses, it's your fault, Moses. It's because, they were, uh, because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. Oh, man, when God sets you free, uh, he doesn't set you free to kill you. God doesn't lead you off a cliff or to a dead end. Remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. If we walk by sight, we're going to see dead ends all the time. But here's the beautiful thing. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So it says, what have you, why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For if we have been, we would, we would have been better off for, it would have been better off for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Oh man, is that where you're at today? Like these Egyptians who've been set free from their bondage, but things don't quite go the way they want, and they, they'd rather go back to the world? They'd rather go back to that misery and that suffering. Don't ever let the devil convince you of that. And so what happens, verse 13 says, But then Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again or forever. But here's the key, verse 14. What did the Lord say? Or Moses says, the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Verse 15 says, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. It's a time to pray, guys. We should always be praying. But if you continue to pray for the same thing, the same thing, even though God continues to crack open that little door and you continue to pray, well, God, that door needs to be open a little bit wider before I know it's you. Not quite ready yet, God. Give me another sign. Boom. COVID-19. Give me another sign. God, you know, boom. Division, right? I mean, what, what, what more do we need? There's a time to pray and there's a time to move. There's a time to act. Here's where we'll close here today. The book of James and this idea of a time to pray and a time to move, guys. Don't get me wrong. Praying is always first. You don't want to move and then pray. Okay, God, I made a bad move. You know, help me. God will answer that prayer. But a lot of times that's going to be a, you know, a tougher route. It's better to pray first, make sure it's God, but then move. Because I think that's the tendency in our lives too many times is we start second-guessing what God is putting in our hearts. And you see, that's where you'll end up finding yourself one day to be a pastor, to be a missionary. It's little by little beginning to trust God with everything. Little by little, guys, stepping into this faith and hearing the voice of God and having these desires that come from God put in your heart and you have a choice. You either act upon these things or you say, I need another five years, God. Wait until I get my retirement at maximum, you know, amount, and then I'll retire. Then I'll come and serve you. I don't think that's walking by faith. I don't think that's if God is telling you to do something different. Don't procrastinate on it. Don't try to talk yourself out of it because I'll tell you, it's not you so much talking yourself out of it. It's a little bit of even the enemy in there who's not wanting you to step into these things that God has prepared you to do. Remember, there's a battle, guys. There's a battle going on. But here's what James says. I love this verse in James. 
James chapter 2, verse 14. Faith and works. It says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace and be warm and filled, and yet do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. You see, we can begin to play these mental gymnastics and think that as long as in my mind I'm uh, living by faith but not really demonstrating this faith, that somehow I have an active relationship with God. That verse just says, hey, faith without works is dead. To just sit and believe it and, and believe it in your mind but not to live it, that's not a faith. That's not an active faith. That's not a trusting God. Verse 18 says, But some may say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. Show me your faith without works. <laughs> and I'll show you my faith by my works. You see, this faith in God, when I give myself to God, it will change the things that I do. Bottom line. That's it. Those are the works. My faith will produce works. It's not the other way around. I don't work for my faith. We have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. But once we have experienced this faith, think about what faith is. It's trusting. Yeah, I, I trust you, God, but I'm going to stay right here. Is that an act of faith? And so all I would say is like Paul. God has been speaking to a lot of you in here. I know that. God has put desires in your hearts. How do I know that? Because God is no different with me than he is with you. Pursue these desires. Understand that these desires came from God. You first gave yourself to God. Now he's asking you to give he gave himself for you. Now he's asking you to give yourself for him. To give into that desire. And to trust that he has you. And that he will take care of you. And that he will strengthen you. I mean, guys, don't we need to hear that in a time like today? We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen next month. We do know that God is going to pour out His Spirit, and I believe He already is beginning to pour out His Spirit. People are being finally woken up to the realities of the book, this book, the Bible. The smoke and mirrors is all of a sudden we're seeing it for what it is. This deception, it all comes from Satan himself. Pawns. Many people are pawns in this game right now. But it's up to you and I, guys, to desire the things of God, to get serious with God, to give ourselves to God. And be partners with Him in this work. And what is His work primarily, guys? Is it to build big churches? Big monuments? The church to be so wealthy and handing out $100 bills that everyone goes, wow, I want to be that part of that church. God loves people. God created each and every one of us. God breathed life into us. Did you know that before you were even in your mother's womb, God knew you? God is reconciling His creation, His creatures back to Himself. This is the message we carry, guys, because, you see, we understand those who have been held in captivity and bondage and slavery, who've been set free, understand that others can be set free now, too. That's all we are, is beggars who found some bread, and we're looking to share where we found the bread with the other beggars. So be useful to the kingdom, I pray. Be filled with the Spirit. This koinonia, get involved. 
just humbly pray in your hearts, Lord, yes, I know you've been ministering to me here today. There are things that I know that I want to do for your kingdom. That you've been pleading with me for a long time. Thank you for your patience, by the way, God. Thank you for your long suffering. Thank you for your mercy. Don't think God is condemning you here today. But I believe through the writings of Paul, God would say, you've prayed, now go. You've prayed, now do it. Make this faith active. That's what we need here today, guys. So I pray that you would pray that. Lord, here I am, send me. Whatever capacity that is. First, I pray that it would be God continue to mold me into the image of Jesus. I want to continue to decrease so that Jesus may increase in me. And then through that changing, may I infect, I love that word, not affect, infect other people. Because it's contagious. When somebody's sold out for Jesus, guys, it's contagious. It's contagious to see a whole group of guys and their brides over here with their jackets and, and riding around. I mean, what a testimony. To live for Jesus openly. Because remember what he says, guys. There's going to be a lot of people who don't want to be identified with Christ. Maybe even in these coming times. I'll just kind of lay low as a Christian and kind of let things unfold. And hopefully nobody knows I'm really a Christian because I might get some persecution. Remember what Jesus said? If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. But if you acknowledge me before men, then I will acknowledge you before my Father. Are you acknowledging Jesus here today? Then acknowledge him loudly, clearly in the sun of the day, not at the night. We're children of the light. And let's glorify him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for these, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for Jesus dying on the cross. Thank you for him being our substitution. That the death that he died becomes my death. And the life that he now lives becomes my life. It's an exchange. And so, Father, I just pray today that anyone who has not received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that today would be their day of salvation. Lord, that we would just humbly in our hearts confess to you that we need you. That we need more of you. And that we want you as well. It's not begrudgingly to be a child of God. It's a privilege. It's a joy. We are heirs of the kingdom. Co-heirs with Jesus. Not equal, but we're with him. We're his. So Father, you know the needs here. You know what you've been speaking to each and every one. I pray that today you would seal it. Seal it with the Holy Spirit, Father. I pray that the enemy would be bound in Jesus' name, that he would not be able to take this word that has been planted today, that you would begin to water it and to grow it, to open the doors that need to be opened, so that you may be glorified through all of it, and more people will come to faith in you. So Lord, bless your servants here, your children. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
God bless you. If you want prayer this morning, I'll be up here. Pastor's in the back. We have some deacons. Barry over here with the uh, American shirt on as a deacon. He'll pray with you. Thank you for coming today. God bless. Have a safe trip home.